that one. Tell me when. Okay. All right. Well, we welcome you to our Sabbath uh, broadcast today. We appreciate you being with us and uh, give some folks a chance to get online. I know that we're running a little bit behind today. Uh, had some technical difficulties and uh, so we're running a little bit behind but we do welcome you to our broadcast and we appreciate you being a part of our of our services today we want to uh, thank those that are joining us by way of Facebook of course those that will be watching this later on on uh, on YouTube we welcome you to the broadcast Defending Faith Ministries and uh, hope that the Lord richly blesses you uh, like I said we'll give folks an opportunity to get on on the line here uh, and uh, join us. We hope you have your Bible today. If you don't, then we'll give you a chance to go get it. Uh, had an opportunity this morning to go out in the woods and preach to the Green Berets. Of course, this is uh, um, Veterans Day. Give me a hanky, please. Uh, this is Veterans Day, and uh, we uh, want to thank all those who served our country. Uh, we uh, thank you for your sacrifice and your service. I I posted my old picture from 1981 on, uh, um, actually it might, might have been 1982, I can't, can't remember, but uh, it was a long time ago. I posted that on Facebook the, this morning uh, showing how I was young and, and uh, a lot smaller, uh, by the way. But uh, we do thank those that have sacrificed and given the ultimate sacrifice for our country and for our, our freedom. And we're so thankful uh, for our veterans and those that serve place themselves in harm's way uh, a happy veterans day to you and so we're uh, we want to thank you for joining us and being a part of our uh, our meeting today and uh, do we have anybody online with us yet nobody have joined us on online yet but uh, we'll give folks an opportunity to be with us uh, but uh, we do thank you again for for being here uh, thank those again for joining us uh, on uh, uh, on YouTube uh, want to um, uh, say hello to our folks and our friends there in Garden City, Kansas. Uh, they'll be watching this uh, uh, in, a, in a delayed uh, broadcast. And so we appreciate them being a part of, uh, of, of the Sabbath services today. And I uh, hope that, uh, that the Lord richly blesses you. Uh, still have no one joining us on our, are we live? We are live. Okay, so no one's joining us yet. And so we hope that, the, uh, that someone will, will come on pretty soon. Um, we're going to continue on. We're going to sing some songs today and uh, get right into, into the service, right into the message. Uh, today we're going to sing some psalms uh, and uh, spend some time uh, getting into the Word of the Lord. So if you've got your Bible, let's turn to Psalm chapter number 19 and we'll sing uh, Psalm chapter number 19 today. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable or right in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So Psalm 19 and verse number 14. <clears throat> Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be right in thy sight. Let's see, Psalm 119 and verse number 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse number nine.
according to thy word, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. And then back in Psalm chapter number 34, Psalm chapter number 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Verse 1, 2, 3. Peter chapter number 1, 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 25, the word of the Lord endureth forever and ever and ever and ever. And this is the word which by the gospel or the good news is preached unto you. The word, yeah, the word all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way to Revelation, the word of the Lord endures forever and ever and ever. of Ephesians are grafted in into Israel. We are Israel. We are the spiritual Israel that uh, Yahweh had planned for, that His Word would be placed upon our hearts and we would walk according to His ways, according to Yeshua's ways, as our Lord and Savior. Verse number 9, sing it with me. Ye are a chosen generation.
that you should show for the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Amen and thank the Father that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, not strange, not weird, but treasured, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, the light which his son, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, has brought into the world. And so we're thankful. Do we have some folks joining us now? we got some folks on, on, online with us, so we appreciate that. We welcome you to the broadcast we hope the Father richly blesses you. As I said before, I got a chance to preach to the Green Berets today and uh, was a part of some Green Beret training out in our area and uh, was able to uh, go out into the woods this morning and uh, around the campfire and, uh, and take the Word of God and open up the Word of God and preach to the troops. Uh, interesting that th that came on Veterans Day and so we're so, so thankful for our veterans and our troops and those that... Uh, fight for our freedom. Of course, they're out training uh, and uh, was able to be a part of that training time. So we're so thankful uh, for that. I know the folks in Garden City, of course, this is a part of their uh, their, their service time and their Sabbath worship uh, is the message time. And uh, and so I know they're they're looking forward to going through the book of Joshua and we'll, we'll try to try to revisit that uh, at the next broadcast, but I wanted to try to use this as an opportunity to answer a few questions. From time to time during the week, we get questions posed to us as to why we do this or what our uh, what our position is on this and uh, why do we believe this. And, and so I want to try to deal with some of that and answer a few questions. And please, anytime you have a question, Anytime you have a, a, a something that you don't agree with, something that you don't understand, why we have a position, please feel free to uh, private message me. Please feel free to send us a note, uh, drop us an email, and we'll try to uh, address those questions. You know, uh, I could stand here and preach to you all day long, but if there's not a dialogue and we're not learning and we're not asking questions, probably the biggest thing that happened in our life and in our ministry is we begin to ask questions. Why do we do this? And why do we worship on Sunday? And why do we not follow the Ten Commandments? And why do we not obey the food laws? And why do we not obey these things? Well, why, why was it an abomination then, but it's no longer an abomination now? But certain things in today's society were still an abomination, but other things were no longer an abomination. And why do we believe that Paul had the authority to, to do this and to supposedly change the law? And all these questions begin to come up in our minds we didn't have good answers for them. We began to study, we began to research, we began to study and, and truly, truly search out the truth for God's Word. And it was through these things that the Father has given us a little bit of wisdom. You know, I'm not saying that we know everything and that we have all, all knowledge, uh, but we're trying to grow towards a, a closer walk with the Lord. And uh, we're not going to try to condemn you for your position, and we hope that you won't condemn us. But we're hoping that we'll learn together and we'll be able to grow together towards a of following the truth of, uh, of Yeshua, the truth of Yahweh, understanding that Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it or to preach it fully, not to end it, not to complete it as far as uh, doing away with it, but to fulfill it and complete it as far as upholding it and to show us how that we could live it uh, and walk in it fully. Of course, he says in Matthew chapter 5 that not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law until all be fulfilled, till heaven and earth pass. Uh, not one not one jot or tittle will be moved from the law till all is fulfilled and all is completed, until all is preached fully. Uh, and so we hold to that very, very much so. When when God God in the flesh tells us that in Matthew chapter five, that should be a very key part of our life, and we should hold on to that and understand that heaven and earth is not passed. We're still here, and so therefore that holds a lot of weight. And so how can we say that Paul had the authority to, to abolish anything when Yeshua plainly said in Matthew 5 that until heaven and earth pass, very key phrase, uh, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the Torah, from the truth of God's law, till all be fulfilled. And so I had a question this week uh, from a brother, 
and uh, I, I won't call his name, but uh, if he watches, he'll know who he is. Uh, and the question was, uh, in, in relation to Acts chapter number 15, how can we read Acts chapter number 15 and we can, we can still say that we're to follow the law? And, uh, of course, he was referring to Acts 15 and verses uh, uh, 20 through uh, 24. And then he referenced to Acts chapter number 21, verses 24 and 25. And so I want to go to that today and try to answer a few questions and try to uh, place some things into uh, relativity, if you will, to try to answer uh, some, uh, some things. If you've got your Bible, I'd like for you to get your Bible and open up to Acts chapter number 15. We'll begin reading in verse number 1, and we'll read all the way down uh, to uh, verse number 24. 20, well, I'll probably just read on uh, through verse number 29 uh, and into verse 30 maybe, uh, Acts chapter number 15. Uh, I will be reading from the King James Bible. I also use a, uh, a restored names King James Bible. Uh, it uses the names of Yahweh and Yeshua and has restored those sacred names. Uh, but uh, for the sake of study today, I'll be using the regular King James Bible. Uh, not a 1611. Now, those of you that say uh, you hold to the 1611, you don't. Because even the translation that you have is probably a 1769. You can't read a 1611. Anyway, 1611, and of course a little side note, 1611 still has the Apocrypha in it. And your your translation of King James Bible does not have an apocrypha in it, so therefore you're not using a 1611. Also in the 1611, there was not a J used. The name of Jesus was not in there. It was spelled with an I, Iesus. And so therefore, uh, even in the King James 1611, the, word, the, the letter J was not even in our English language at that time. So you don't use a 1611. You use a 1769. But that's just a little side note to give you a little bit of information. I'll begin reading in Acts chapter number 15, begin reading verse number 1. <clears throat> says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And, for, and, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. <clears throat> then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at, at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, and the residue of men, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things." Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren, 
And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from, from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. Now when you look at this in context, you see uh, some things that uh, throw up some red flags and some things that cause us to ask questions. First of all, the context of the whole chapter deals with salvation. You can find that in verse number one. Verse number one, and certain men which came down from, from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. There's the context and there's the crux of the of the disputation. Now, when you go back and you start adding st things to salvation, that's called legalism. <clears throat> a lot of people, they want to say that because we follow the law of God and because we walk in accordance to God's law, that we're legalists. Let me just say this, and I, I've said it over and over and over again, and sometimes I just get, I just get tired, tired of arguing about it. We do not believe that salvation is by works. First of all, salvation is holy by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you go back into Acts chapter number 15, you'll see a very important verse of scripture there in verse number, verse number 14, where it says, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, you folks that don't believe in the sovereignty of God, you have a problem with that verse of scripture, but it's right there. That he took out of the Gentiles, called out of the Gentiles, people for his name. To take out of the Gentiles, people for, not to call all the Gentiles, but to take out of the Gentiles, out of them a people for his name. So the context of, of Acts chapter number 15 deals with salvation. The Jews, the Judaizers, uh, otherwise known, uh, uh, they had preached and taught that salvation was only by circumcision and following the law, following the Talmud. Rabbis and rabbinic Judaism have always said that unless you follow the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the laws that they insist, then you cannot be saved. Much like the Catholics teach that if you're not in the Catholic Church and you can't and, and 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 you're not a part of the Catholic Church, then you're not a part of the true church and therefore you can't be saved. Baptist brothers and those uh, that that uh, uh, hold themselves uh, to a certain sect of, uh, of Baptist faith uh, teach that if you're not saved by a King James Bible and you're not baptized in a Baptist church, then 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 you're not saved. I've heard that directly directed to me. And so when we look at those things and we consider those things, it ought to cause us to throw up some red flags. Of course, Acts, the book of Acts, is a book of transition. We we're always taught the book of transition, transitioning from, from uh, uh, the Gospels into what we know of as the church age. And, and grace has always been present. Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and Abraham uh, was given grace. And, and all the way back to Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, we see grace. And so grace is not a new thing as far as the New Testament goes, but grace has all, all, always been there. So let me just get this clear and don't get it settled once and for all. When we teach to follow the law of God, we're talking about for holiness and separation, but salvation is holy strictly by faith by by the grace of God, even you go back to the book of Genesis and you uh, you read concerning Abraham, 
Abraham's circumcision did not come until after Abraham had already been declared righteous because of his faith. God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision as a separation. But Abraham's faith was already set and his righteousness was already secure in the fact that he had already put faith in God, faith in Yahweh, and his circumcision did not come until after he had, he had received faith. Let's go back and let's consider the Hebrews. Let's consider the, uh, uh, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt. Yahweh brought them out of Egypt and after he had rescued them and saved them, he gave them his laws. And it was with that that he insisted not only that they had the law on, on tablets, but in Deuteronomy chapter number 10, the whole, the, the whole reason for him bringing his people out of Egypt was to write his laws on their heart. Let me look, let me look, look there just as a side note. If you'll look over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 10, and you'll see, of course, this is in the Torah. This is uh, Deuteronomy is a, is a repeat of the, uh, of the Torah or the law of God. But in Deuteronomy chapter number 10 and verse number 12, it says, And now Israel, what doth Yahweh thy Elohim require of thee, or thy God require of thee, but to fear Yahweh thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve Yahweh thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. To keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is Yahweh's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Only Yahweh had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Here's the key, verse 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For Yahweh your Elohim, or your God, is Elohim of Elohim, and God of gods, and sovereign of sovereigns, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment, Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. And so it was always from the beginning that, that God's law would be on our heart. Abraham, Abraham was, was given the, the covenant of circumcision, but it was always about the heart. Abraham's heart was in tune with Yahweh. It was in tune with God, and so therefore it was never about the circumcision. But in Acts chapter number 15... The Judaizers are making it about circumcision. Okay, so we need to get to the gist of what's going on in Acts chapter number 15. We see that uh, in verse number 20, it says uh, we see the sentence from, from the, the apostles, uh, mainly from James, there, the pastor there at the Jerusalem church. And he says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. These are the minimal expectations of the new believers as they grow in the law of God from the lawless Gentile customs. What we have to remember is that these people were, were, were steeped in pagan Gentile rituals and Gentile customs. And so therefore they were coming out of these things and part of their rituals were to, 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 to partake of blood and for things strangled. And so the, the guidelines were laid down that they would abstain from, from the, the, the pollutions of idolatry, that they would abstain from fornication, that they would abstain from things strangled and from blood, from drinking blood and for, and for, for uh, uh, in, ingesting blood. But the key is in verse number 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. What would be the purpose of that? Well, the, these four things were minimal expectations as they grew. And as they would grow in the Lord, they would learn from the teachings of Moses or the law of God each Sabbath day. In Matthew chapter number, number 23, I believe it is, it refers to Moses' seat. Let me see if I'm on the right, the right chapter here. Matthew chapter number 23. 
uh, and verse number 1. Uh, then spake Yeshua, or Jesus, to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, Moses' seat was a, was a concrete, uh, it, it was a seat that, that sat outside the temple. And the rabbis and the Pharisees would sit in that seat and they would read the law of Moses. And Yeshua affirmed what they were doing. Look what he says. All therefore, verse number two, saying, there, saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. Meaning everything that they tell you sitting in that seat, you do it. Because they're reading the law of Moses. And everybody thinks that, that that's Moses' law. But, but it's the law that God gave Moses to give to the people. He said, that observe and do. All therefore whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do after their works. For they say and do not. And so James is laying out the foundation in Acts chapter number 15. He's given them instructions because in verse number 21, as they grow in the Lord, they're going to learn the law of God. It's much like in our churches today. Someone comes to the Lord and they come to faith. They, they, uh, we, we have minimal expectations for them. Someone, uh, someone receives Christ. They say, I want to be saved. Uh, uh, we, we pray for them, they, they believe on the Lord, they confess the Lord, and, and they, they repent, and, and they, they say, I believe that uh, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, is the son, son of God, I believe He rose on the third day, and they believe, and they receive Him as their Savior. Well, then we don't tell them to, to oh, okay, we'll go out and, uh, and live your life. No, we set expectations for them. I said, okay, here's some things you need to start doing. Number one, you need to quit fornicating. You need to quit sleeping around. You need to quit. You need to quit uh, uh, being drunk. You need to. You need to start reading your Bible. You need to start coming to church. And you and why? Do, why do they need to start coming to church? Because there, they're going to learn about the things of of God. James is setting minimal expectations for these young believers, these Gentile converts that are coming out of paganism and false god worship, and he lays out four things for them. It's not just four things that we're supposed to do, but he gives them minimal expectations because why? Verse 21, because if, uh, Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Minimal expectations for new believers and then they'll grow in the Lord and they'll grow towards a closer walk with the Lord. Do I believe that, that a person needs to be circum, uh, circumcised? Yes, I do. For salvation? No. For separation? Yes. I do. Are they going to go to hell if they're not? No. No, they're not. But these are things for separation, not for salvation. But the context is for salvation. We need to get that in our head and we need to understand that. That Acts chapter number 15, the, the argument and the disputation and the dissension was not about following the law of God, but it was about uh, 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 being circumcised in order to be saved. That, and and we, we have made that very clear. Salvation is holy by, by grace through faith in the, the Lord Jesus and Yeshua Messiah. And so therefore we don't, we don't believe that, uh, that uh, salvation is by works. But we do believe that salvation is, that, that uh, it is a salvation that works. We begin to show our works after our salvation. But then in verse number 24, there seems to be a little bit of contention, okay? Now in verse number 24 of verse number 15, it says, For as much as we have heard that certain went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. Now in our King James Bible, that seems to say, Oh, well, you don't have to keep the law. You don't have to keep the law. So therefore, the law is gone. Now, how many times have, have we heard? Oh, well, Jesus uh, uh, fulfilled the law. The Bible says that he's the end of the law for righteousness. No, he's the goal of the law. Well, and I've heard, heard, I've heard this. Oh, Paul, Paul got rid of all that stuff. Paul abolished all that stuff. Paul has no authority to abolish the law. But when you go back and you study history and you find out that this phrase, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, is not in the original text. Now, I've, 
I did some research, and, and in the 1550 Stephanus, I have a 1590, 1599, um, well, I, I have a 1611. It's not an original. Of course, it's a copy of a 1611. I have a 1599 Geneva Bible. And in the 1550 Stephanus, of course, it comes from the Texas Receptus. And the King James Bible it comes from the Texas Receptus. And we, we hold to the validity and the legitimacy of the Texas Receptus. And there are those that would say, well, the King James Bible is perfect and everything. I'm I, I need, to, I need you to reconsider that thought and, and understand it's a good translation, but it's not perfect. Okay, The only perfect one is that which is the originals, and unfortunately we don't have that anymore. But in the 1550, we do have some prior copies and some prior uh, translations and some prior uh, writings, but in the 1550 Stephanus Bible, the word or the phrase you must be circumcised and keep the law is not found there. It's not found there at all. That was added by the translators. The English translators added. When you add something, you change the meaning and you change the entire context and it causes a seed of doubt to be placed in your mind when you add, add words. Also in, in chapter 21, if you look in chapter 21 in verse number 25, uh, it's a sort of a rehash as they're, they're back on the mission field and they're reading the decision of the disciples there in the book of, uh, uh, of there in uh, Jerusalem from, from chapter 15. And it says in verse number 25, it said, As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only. That phrase, that they observe no such thing save only, was also added. That's not in the earlier text. And so when you look at those additions to Scripture and you, and you say, well, 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 what am I supposed to believe? Well, we need to, we need to go back and believe what, what was originally written. That the law of God was to be written upon our hearts and we were to, to, to obey His commandments and keep His commandments according to His word, according to His will, and according to His way. And so why do we believe and follow the law of God? Because we believe the Bible teaches that we are to follow the law of God. Let us also consider this also. The writers of the New Testament. Of course, most of our churches and most of, and most of my adult Christian life has been, been focused around learning the New Testament. I was in the military and uh, they gave us pocket New Testaments. We was in the fifth grade. And the Gideons came by the school and gave us pocket New Testaments. And so, therefore, the push was the New Testament, the New Testament, the New Testament. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not uh, downplaying the importance of the New Testament. I'm not. Please, don't, don't misunderstand. But the problem I was telling a brother this morning, a problem that we have is we have forgotten the foundation. And we've spent so much time on building the roof that we forgot to shore up the foundation. The foundation is the law of God, the Old Testament. And we've spent so much time p teaching people about Jesus Christ and teaching about uh, people about the cross that we forgot to talk to them about creation and about the law of God and the expectations of, of, of God and sin and the consequences of sin and all of those types of things. We, we forgot the foundation. And we need to teach the foundation because in teaching the foundation, it'll help us to understand the, the, the consequence of sin and the payment for that sin. And the importance of the payment for that sin. But when we, when we look at these scriptures and, we, and people ask the question, how, well, how can you follow the law? Because I believe the Bible teaches us that we are to follow the law. But getting back to my thought was, the writers of the New Testament, they didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to, to refer to. They didn't have Romans and Acts and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. They, they didn't have those books. Why? Because they were being written. What did Paul preach from? What did Timothy preach from? What did Peter preach from? What did James preach from? What did Philip preach to the Ethiopian eunuch from? They all preached from the Torah. They preached from the, 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 the Old Testament scriptures. They preached from the prophets and from the Psalms. What did they sing from? Well, it wasn't the red all-American hymnal. I can tell you that right now. They sang from the Psalms. They read from the from the Torah and from the prophets. They read from the historical books and they read uh, from all of the Old Testament writings. 
Why? In order to build a foundation for their faith. And so when we look at this scripture, we see there's some questionable things. These things were added. You must be circumcised and keep, and keep the law. That was added by the translators. You go back to Acts chapter number 21 and verse number 25, and you read that, uh, that phrase, that they observed no such thing save only, was added by the translators, and it is not in, in the, uh, in the earlier, earlier text, in the earlier writings. And it really causes us to ask a question. And it really causes us to be really confused if we don't know what the answer to the question is. When we look at the at the Word of God, and they say, "Well, well, why do you why do you hold to the Word of God, or 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 why do you walk uh, why do you walk according to the to the law?" Well, I have to go to the Book of Acts again and look at chapter number twenty four, and look at what Paul says in Acts chapter number twenty four and verse number thirteen. This is Paul. He's been accused of not keeping the law and, and been accused of, uh, of preaching against the law. And he says, he says, verse 13 of chapter 24, he said, Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call a heresy or sect, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So why do we hold to the law? Well, we don't believe the law has been abolished. We don't believe the law is, is done for. Let us consider the feast days, the holy days. We just finished up with uh, a Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. We're coming into the season in, in our society and in, in American society, the, uh, the season of Christmas. More money, more, more uh, retail, and, and more stress. And more um, depression comes at this time of year more than any other time of the year. It's not a biblical holy day. It's not set aside as a biblical holy day. Christmas was Christmas is not in the Bible. Oh, the birth of Christ is in the Bible, but but you go and you study it out. Yeshua was born in uh, in the at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's real easy to figure out. You just have to just do do the math. If Yeshua Messiah was 33 and a half years old when he died, and he died at Passover, which is in the spring of the year, around March, middle of March, if he died at Passover, 33 and a half years, just add six months. And that'll put him at 34 years old, and it'll show you where he, where he was born. At the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot. He could not have been born in December because historically shepherds don't keep their flocks in the field in the winter time. The shepherds don't stay out in the field in the winter time because it's too cold. So we got to be smart about this thing and use our minds and use our brains. God give us a brain to think with. We need to use that brain and be able to rationalize things and understand uh, what the Bible's talking about. We need to look at it from a Hebrew mindset instead of a European Greek mindset. And so why do I believe that I should follow the law? Because God told me that I should follow his law. Back in Deuteronomy chapter number chapter number uh, 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 11, I'll just read what he says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verse number 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of Yahweh your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. Why do I follow the law of God? Why am I supposed to do that? Because God says to do that. Let, let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 2. I was going to focus the, today mostly on the, on the book of Colossians, but I want to I want to focus on on this just for a few minutes. A lot of folks will will bring this verse of scripture up, Colossians chapter number chapter number two, and they'll try to say, well, well, the law is uh, is done away with in Colossians chapter number two. But but is it? We need to test that test that uh, that theory. So in Colossians chapter number two, the Bible says. <clears throat> Verse number 8, I'll begin in verse number 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, Yeshua, 
Jesus Christ uh, rebuked the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7 because of their traditions of men. That they were teaching for doctrines the tradition of men and rejecting the doctrines and the truth of God. Uh, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ or Messiah. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. There's that circumcision of the heart. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of, of Messiah, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him or brought back to life, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. People say, well, there's the law. No, no, no. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, of triumphing over them. The ordinances here, if you get your concordance out and you will study the, the dictionary, are public decrees or dogmas. These never reflect and never refer back to the law of God. These are always talking about man-made ordinances and man-made doctrines. Those fences that the rabbis placed around the law of God, now known as the Talmud, uh, those are the ordinances that was written against them and the extra laws that were added to the laws of God. Only 613 laws given in the Bible, and of those 613, not all apply to every person. But then verse number 16 is the key. This is what everybody says. This is where they say, this is where your uh, the, the Sabbath is uh, done away with, the food is done away with, uh, food laws are done away with. You can eat anything you want to eat. And the Sabbath is done away with because of this verse right here. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come but the body of Christ. Let no man therefore judge you. Let no man therefore despise you or condemn you. That's a better word. Let no man therefore condemn you in food or in drink or in respect of an holy day, in your respect of a holy day, or because you choose to eat according to God's plan, or because you, because you drink according to God's plan, or because you, you uh, uh, rem uh, uh, pay attention to the new moon and blow the shofar as according to Psalm 81, or because you uh, practice and worship on the Sabbath. Why? Verse number 17. Which are a shadow of things to come. Not done away with. A shadow of things to come. You remove the thing, there's no longer a shadow. Remove the Sabbath, there's no longer a shadow. Remove the food laws, there's no longer a shadow. Remove the respect of a holy day, there's no longer a shadow. Remove uh, Sukkot, the shadow's gone. Remember, the shadow is always a uh, a, a reflection of when the light shines on something, it, it throws a shadow. The Sabbath is a shadow of the heavenly. The holy days are a shadow of the heavenly. The new moon is a shadow of the heavenly. The, 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 the food and the, and the dietary regulations are a shadow of the heavenly, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. It's important that we understand. We follow the law of God because God's commanded that we do so. Well, where's God commanded that we do so? Well, Yeshua, Jesus Christ himself, said the same thing in John chapter number 14. We've read those many times. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, he's talking about the moral law. Remember, who was Yeshua? He, he was God in the flesh. So therefore, it's his commandments. He's the one that gave them to Moses on Mount Sinai. He goes on to say there in, 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 Acts, uh, or in, uh, in John chapter number 15. He repeats the same phrase. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, verse number 10, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He continues on with the same, with the same thought there in John, 1 John chapter number 1. I preach this to the troops today. 
First John chapter number one, where he says, uh, uh, I, I'm, "I'm sorry." First John chapter number two says, "And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments." He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I'm being accused of being a legalizer, a legalist, a Judaizer, a heretic. Why? Because I want to follow more closely to my Savior. A legalist adds things to salvation, like works and circumcision. No, salvation is holy by, by grace. I'm thankful for the day that, that, that Yahweh saved me out of sin. I'm thankful for the illustration that he gave in the book of, of, of Exodus, how he saved Israel out of, out of bondage and then gave him his laws. He, he made Abraham righteous and then gave Abraham the covenant. See, it's, it's all in order, but you know, rabbis and rabbinicism and even Christianity has twisted everything around and messed everything up. So we follow the law of God not to be righteous or not to be saved, but we follow the law of God because we are saved. Because we do want to be pleasing to Him. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, said follow me as I follow Him. People say, well, well Paul must have uh, changed the law. Paul must have... Uh, you know, Peter said that it was probably very difficult for us to understand Paul. Peter said there in, uh, in 2 Peter chapter number 3, he says, um, he says in verse number 15, An account that the long-suffering of our Master is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable twist or rest. Those that are unlearned and unstable, they twist the words of God and they try to make them out to... Peter's very clear right here. Things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before... Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yeshua Messiah. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So to answer the question, why do I think that I have to follow the law of God? Look, look you don't have to do anything. Yahweh's not going to take a hook and put it in your nose and cause you to, to follow after him. He, he's not going to do that. He's going to offer you salvation and, and, and he'll save you. But if you say, if you can say that I can be saved and I don't have to live for God, you better rethink that thought. If you can say that I can be saved and I can have eternity in heaven, but I just don't have to live for God, I'm saved and everything's good, my sins are forgiven, I can just go do whatever I want to do, you better rethink that thought. Yeshua said it very clearly in Matthew chapter number 7, Not everyone said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, verse number 21 of Matthew chapter 7, Verse 22 said, Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, or Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not preached? And in thy name have cast out devils? Have we not done the Benny Hinn and, and done all that kind of stuff? And then he says, And in thy name done many wonderful works or many wonderful deeds? Yeshua doesn't say, Enter into the joys of the Lord. Come on in. No, look what he says. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I'm not saying that you have to follow, uh, 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 do the law of God to be saved, but I am saying this. If you think that you can be saved and not be obedient to God's law, you better rethink that position. You better rethink that thought. Why do we follow the law of God? Because we just want to walk closer to Him. We want to walk in obedience to Him. We want to receive the blessing. 
We want to get a blessing. We don't want to be a curse or get a curse. We want to get a blessing. Very clear. Very clear in the word of the word of God. I want to encourage you to, to study the whole Bible, not just one verse or take a verse out of context or one passage of scripture or or of course hinge on the book of Galatians as your whole thing. You need to read Galatians in its context and understand it's talking about salvation. It's not talking about separation and holiness, okay? Remember, salvation is holy by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. His faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Why? Because of his faith. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were given grace, but then they were given the responsibility to follow God's law. Egypt uh, or Israel was taken out of Egypt by the grace of Almighty God. Then he gave them his laws after he removed them from bondage. I was saved by the grace of Almighty God, 1975, so that I could learn His laws and walk in accordance to His way. When we read that in Acts chapter number 15, it's all about salvation. It's not about holiness and separation. But as you grow more towards the Lord, for Moses hath in every city them that read him in the synagogues every Sabbath day. As you grow more in the Lord and you grow more towards him, you'll begin to distance yourself from the traditions of man and distance yourself from the traditions of, of the world and distance yourself from the teachings of false religion and you'll get closer to God, closer to Yahweh, closer to Yeshua and farther away from the world. What's the old saying? Well, the old song we sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me beyond death's open door. I can't remember the words, but I can't live at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me through heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Walk closer to Him. Be more obedient to Him. Follow in His ways, according to His guidelines, according to His laws, according to His Word. And you'll see yourself pulling farther and farther and farther away from the traditions the traditions of man, the preaching and the teaching of the world, and religion, and you'll draw closer in a closer walk with, you, with Yeshua, Messiah, our Master, and our Savior. My prayer for you today is that you'll draw closer to Him. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, uh, Yeshua, Messiah, as your Savior, I pray today that you would seek for Him, that you would turn from your wicked ways, that you would repent and ask Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come into your life and to save your wretched, wicked soul so that you could have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life so that you could have eternal life forevermore. That's my prayer today. Well, thank you for being a part of the services today. Thank you for being a part of the broadcast. We close today with our reading of the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Shema just simply means hear and obey. In Deuteronomy chapter number 6, very... Very clear passage of Scripture, verses 4 through 9. I'll read them to you today and hope that it'll be a blessing to you. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God is one. And thou shalt love Yahweh thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. May Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. May Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Shalom, my friends. May the Lord bless you is our prayer. Take care. We'll see you next time.